Good evening, everyone. I am so sorry for the delay getting going. Um, tonight is Monday, June 7th, and we are live from Orange High School Library for the first time the board is all together. Um, tonight we have Mr. Ken Sue here standing in as counsel. So thank you for being here with us tonight. The Orange County Schools Board of Education pledges to our families, students, staff, and the greater community to conduct our business in a courteous and productive manner, showing respect for fellow board members, staff, and citizens. The board asks its citizens to conduct themselves with the same courtesy towards all staff members and each other. As per board policy, Robert's Rules of Order will be used to conduct meetings, and a moment of silence will be observed before we begin our business. Public comment will be held tonight after the board adopts tonight's agenda. I ask that we remember that tonight that OCS educates our students on the traditional land of the Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation, and that we continue to grow as an organization who values authentic connections and repairs harms with the indigenous people of these lands. We will now have a moment of silence. Thank you so much. The next item up is recognitions this evening and I will turn it over to Dr. Felder. Why, thank you, Chair McKenzie. Thank you and good evening. Uh, Chair McKenzie, Vice Chair Stevens, to the entire uh, board, our students, staff and families. Uh, there are indeed many recognitions and celebrations uh, this month. And, um, and we're going to highlight uh, several tonight. And so uh, here we go. And so the first celebration that we want to recognize, and so it's, it's our future teachers. So it's with great pleasure and honor that I introduce to you Orange County Schools Future Teacher Award recipients this evening. Each young educator received a plaque and a $500 scholarship. Uh, the Future Teachers Program is a recruitment initiative aimed at developing uh, Orange County Schools uh, internal student talent while also encouraging uh, young people to pursue careers in education. So at this time, I will let our Chief Human Resources Officer, Ms. Teresa Cunningham-Brown, share more information about each recipient with you. Ms. Cunningham-Brown? Good evening, everybody. Um, again, I'd like to say congratulations to the graduating class of 2021. Our future teacher participants are Orange County School graduates who intend to pursue careers in education, and all four have the opportunity to receive a conditional employment contract with the district upon completion of their teacher preparation programs. Orange County Schools offers its employees pay vision, life insurance, and boasts one of the highest local teacher salary supplements in the state. As a future teacher recipient, as Dr. Felder indicated, each recipient will receive a $500 scholarship and plaque. We have four recipients this evening. I would like to introduce to you Michaela Adams um, from Orange High School. She will be attending UNCG and her area of concentration will be secondary education English. Graceland Hostley will also at Orange County graduate. She will be attending North Carolina State University and her concentration will be agriculture education. It also gives me great pleasure to introduce to you this evening, Dariana Leon Horta. She is a graduate of Cedar Ridge High School. She will be attending UNCG and her concentration will be middle grades language arts. Our fourth recipient um, for this uh, evening, and we will have her picture at a later date, um, but she was just um, brought to our attention a couple hour ago, uh, hours ago, but we also want to recognize Claudia Dwyer. She is an Orange High School graduate. She will be attending Mount Olive University in the fall, and her concentration will be agriculture education. Again, 
please uh, join me in celebrating our future teachers and our four scholarship recipients this evening. Thank you, uh, Ms. Cunningham Brown. So next, we want to recognize employee excellence. And so Orange County Schools values excellence in their employees. The Orange County School Employee Excellence Program is a recognition program designed to honor outstanding employees who demonstrate excellence in their service to students and families who go well above and beyond their expected job duties and serve as outstanding role models for others across the district. Tonight, there are 13 Orange County employees who fit that bill. These are 13 employees who consistently show these attributes. Aristotle once said, if we are repeatedly what we do, then excellence is not an act, but a habit. All of these employees demonstrate excellence on a daily basis. All of these employees serve as role models for all of us. Drum roll, please. All right. <laughs> okay, there we go. And so uh, it gives me great pleasure to announce uh, our Employee Excellence Award winners. Uh, they are Amanda Todd, Jackie Hester, Jennifer Pebin, Jose Hildago, uh, Caitlin Manson, Keisha Lineberry, Christy Crock, Ryan Miller, Sarah Rogers, Sarah Patterson, Tanya Murphy, Tevin Jones, and Jennifer Parker. Let's give these employees a huge round of applause. All right, there are more recognitions. And so today, um, today was Partnership Academy's graduation. Uh, and so there are a lot of special days and the students educational journey with us, but this is what uh, all of these special days are for. Uh, their last official celebration with us and their families as they graduate from Orange County Schools. Today was our first graduation for the class of 2021. And I have to say, the entire Partnership Academy team led by none other than Mr. Stan Farrington set the high bar for this year's celebrations. Uh, and thank you to the Orange County Speedway for being an excellent host and partner and providing our graduates with an unforgettable experience of a couple of rounds around the Speedway. <laughs> so what a way to, they'll never forget that. Uh, so now before I turn things over to uh, Mr. Farrington, I would like to remind everyone that the photos taken today will be posted on the Orange County Schools uh, website and Flickr channels this week for families to download and print as many as they want. Also, the video of today's graduation is available on our YouTube channel. So without further ado, I'm turning it over to Stan Farrington. Well, thank you guys. Thank everyone. Um, you know, the, the, the support, the turnout was just amazing. And I'm just very pleased with the staff and the students today. It was just a heartfelt ceremony and it was a huge milestone for for each of those students uh this year offered so many different challenges and, and i was able to list some of those and i think dr felder was able to list some of those challenges too but it's it's so many different things that came against them so many reasons why why not but yet they found the uh, inner fortitude to keep pushing and get to this graduation day and so it was a celebration i was telling someone earlier just a few minutes ago actually that i was needing to hydrate because my eyes were leaking I, I just i couldn't help it and i think looking out we saw so many of the parents who um had proud moments and, and just a huge sense of accomplishment for the kids but we could not have done it without the great support of the school board and and, and just the school district and the leadership here I, the last thing i want to say i'll shut up and, and get off of here but um, I've been connected with Partnership Academy now since there was a Partnership Academy. And um, today, I think the school board set a 
partnership academy, new partnership academy uh, record because uh, we had six out of seven board members at the graduation ceremony. And if I'm not mistaken, the one that was not in attendance may have been in the hospital and couldn't come. So in my eyes, that's 100% attendance. And I don't recall ever having 100% board attendance at a Partnership Academy graduation. So I wanna thank you guys uh, for the support as well. So we appreciate that. And um, we hope to uh, continue that right on along. So thank you and, and I am done. Thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Farrington. And congratulations to all of our Partnership Academy seniors. Okay, well, let's keep these recognitions rolling. I think there are a few more photos from the partnership. There we go. Yeah, it was really special. Okay, so uh, one of our district's priorities continues to be a commitment to communication and family engagement. And this evening, I am pleased to be able to recognize Orange County Schools uh, as one of 41 districts in North Carolina uh, to be recognized for the 2020 communications efforts by the North Carolina School Public Relations Association. So congratulations team. And now here's Melanie Stowe, Public Information Officer to provide more details on these prestigious awards. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, McKenzie, Vice Chair Stevens. And let me just say it is so good to hear clapping and like hear you clapping together. That is so exciting. So when I finish, you can clap for all the award winners. Um, but I do want to note uh, this is a this is a this is a prestigious award. This is an award that is judged on four categories, and that's research, planning, implementation plan, and an evaluation. So it's not just did people show up and do we feel good about it but it really is a thoughtful executed um, plan or initiative that we've communicated effectively. And before I share the winners, I just wanna point out a quote uh, by Cheryl Sandberg, who's the author of Lean In. And Cheryl said, the ability to listen is as important as the ability to speak. And when I show and share the award winners, everyone uh, this evening, showed what it meant to listen, to listen to our families and our students and our community, and then their actions supported that, which is why they're all being recognized. Uh, these awards had to occur before October 2020, so no worries, we've got lots more coming next year. And I'd like to go to the next slide and first recognize our three high schools, uh, which is, uh, it's great timing. I don't know if you recall, but last year we were trying to plan graduation in a pandemic and we had a lot of input and our three high schools were each received three awards for their efforts celebrating our class of 2020 while adhering to state and local guidelines so congratulations to the leadership at um, on this slide orange and cedar uh, cedar ridge high schools for their three awards in the categories of digital media engagement special events and programs and then on the next slide, we also want to congratulate the staff and leadership at Partnership for those same three awards and also our IT department for their support of the 2020 graduation live stream videos. Uh, and those are being live streamed again this year. Uh, so we, we continue to, to do uh, what we learned to be a best practice. On the next slide, Orange County Schools was also honored with two excellence in writing awards. And the first um, was for Dr. Felder's um, piece, OCS Commitment to Ex Equity, Excellence, and Access. And also Dr. Keeling and Ms. Bunch received writing honors for our monthly Equity Warrior series. So kudos to these fabulous writers and the ability to again promote uh, equity and our, our mission. On the next slide, the communications team was also recognized for marketing and electronic media efforts, um, highlighting one, our first day of school. Uh, we had to use all the social media because we were not in school in person in August last year. Uh, we also received recognition for our graphic design efforts, efforts surrounding our 3W campaign so that we could get back into schools. 
and also our marketing campaign surrounding internet access and the different options that we provided and shared with our uh, families and community. And last but not least, our family liaisons under the leadership of Ms. Sandra Blefko, uh, who are there photographed on the next slide, initiated several new programs in 2020, including our parent academy sessions in English, Spanish, Karen, and Burmese. So kudos to um, all of these folks. They are great examples that we all are responsible for uh, communication. And they are not the only examples uh, and stay tuned. We, we have some more things that we've uh, promoted and shared at a national and state level and look forward to recognizing other um, Orange County school staff and employees soon. So round of applause for them, please. We are not done. <laughs> more to come. Uh, next slide, please. So indeed, we're going to keep the recognitions rolling tonight as we want to congratulate one of our very own, our own board member, uh, Dr. Jennifer Moore, who earned a doctorate in business administration on Saturday, June 5th from Bellevue University. Her dissertation project is titled Implementing Needs Assessment and Task Analysis in North Carolina Public Schools. Congratulations, Dr. Moore. We are so happy and so proud of you. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Well, next slide, please. So June is Pride Month. Uh, and Pride Month is when the world's LGBTQ plus communities come together and celebrate the freedom to be themselves. Pride gatherings are rooted in the arduous history of minority groups who have struggled for decades to overcome prejudice and be accepted for who they are. People around the world face violence and uh, inequality and sometimes torture, even execution because of who they love, how they look and who they are. Sexual orientation and gender identity are integral aspects of ourselves and should selves and should, I'm sorry, and, and should never lead to discrimination or abuse. This month, OCS is so proud to celebrate National Prep Month. So now here's Daniel Kearns, school counselor at New Hope Elementary, who will say more about Pride Month in Orange County Schools. Right. Good evening, everyone. Um, like Dr. Felder said, my name is Daniel Kearns, and I am one of the school counselors at New Hope Elementary School. And I'm here this evening to share about the importance and meaning of Pride Month, um, why it should be celebrated, not just this month, but all the time, and then a little bit about me as an educator and a person. Um, so the meaning of Pride Month changes for me every single day. So the more I grow and mature, the more I understand the need for this month. So initially, when I thought about the laws and policies put in place to protect all people, I questioned, why can't we all just do good? You know, be kind and show love. Why do the right things that seem so common to me have to be put into writing? Nevertheless, I learn why this is every day. The world isn't always friendly for people who don't fit into a certain box. It's in the history of this country. However, I personally use the history of this country and even of this district to build up myself and others around me, which is why this month's celebration is extremely necessary. So Pride Month is a time to stop, reflect, and celebrate the beauty of love. It is a time to recognize that no matter who you are, who you love, or how you identify, you are deserving of love and celebration. This month is about celebrating our friends, staff members, families, and most importantly, our students. You see, it is not our job to try to tell someone who they can be or who they can love or to define someone else's experience in this world. Instead, we let them know that they are enough just the way they are by creating safe and affirming spaces for them to grow. It has been 52 years since the Stonewall riots, but here we are still fighting for the chance for all people to be loved, included and supported. 
So this month stands as a reminder of how far we have come, but also how much further we have to go. So honestly, I could sit here and teach all of you about every leader, advocate, policy, and law that has brought about so much needed change LGBTQIA plus community. I could even explain and define what it actually means to be lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, intersex, agender, asexual, pansexual, gender binary, non-binary, and so on. And you know what? I could even go into details and statistics that show an increase in physical and verbal assaults, mental health referrals, self-harm and suicidal thoughts and attempts, and lack of support for LGBTQIA plus youth. And lastly, I could even provide research based steps, strategies and trainings on what can and should be done to support our students and staff who identify as LGBTQIA+. However, that is not the message I want to share today. Instead, here is my message. Change is happening and change will continue to happen. See, I go to sleep every night and wake up every morning because I want this world to be a better place. I am currently finishing up my seventh year in education, and over these past seven years, I have hugged students whose parents wouldn't hug them. I have cried with students who felt they just weren't good enough. I have allowed students to just sit with me because of fear that no one around them would be as accepting as I was. And it breaks my heart even more to state that I have even lost a student who didn't know just how much he was truly loved. And I can't let that happen again which is why we must teach love and acceptance of everyone, especially during Pride Month. I loved being a classroom teacher, and now I love being a counselor. But what I love the most, more than anything, is being me. 100% wholeheartedly, authentically, and unapologetically me. And I want to work in a district that loves and celebrates me for all that I am, but then doubles, maybe even triples that love for our staff, families, and students. And so this Pride Month, I want you all to know that I promise to teach your kids that differences are okay and that love is the only answer. I promise to nurture them when they are sad and laugh at them when they're having the best day ever. I promise to be an example of love and empathy and to ensure that each student has a safe place with me. In addition, I want to challenge and ensure that not only is my office a safe space, but every office, every classroom, every school building, and every aspect of this district. Now, you see, I truly love seeing the pride shirts, the posts on social media, the rainbow color attire and displays all last week, because I know just how much that meant to students, staff, and families, but also how much those little gestures teach our students about the importance of love, inclusion, and allyship. However, we all know that deep down inside, that isn't quite enough. We need more safe spaces. We need more allies. We need more representation. We need more knowledge. We need more training. And we could always, always, always use some more love. We need to know that issues within our district support our students, staff, and families, educate ourselves and our community, and then advocate for equity over equality. Orange County, we can do all of that. And now it is time to ensure that diversity and opportunity inspire achievement in this district. And I will happily admit that having a gender support plan is certainly a step in the right direction. I am so thankful to Orange County Schools for standing for equity and inclusion, as I understand we have and shall continue to make strides in becoming more equitable for all. Now, Orange County Schools, I'm gonna be very honest. I want change, but see, not for me, for us. You see, I am only one, just one person who identifies within the LGBTQIA community. And I searched for many years to finally find my voice. But what about the rest of this community? Our families, our students, and our staff. They deserve a voice too. So I want to leave you all with this little reminder. Pride Month is a celebration of people like me and people like you. That's what love is truly all about. Thank you all for your time and happy Pride Month, Orange County Schools. This month is truly a celebration. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Mr. Kearns. I think I can speak for all of us that you have given us something to really think about and chew on as a board. And I give you my commitment that I will keep pushing hard to affirm everyone in our district, our staff and our students. And I feel certain that other board members feel the same way. So thank you again for being here, for speaking out, for taking a stand. And um, we are grateful to you to be here to celebrate pride for the first time in Orange County schools. Thank you. So um, also while we are celebrating pride as a board and as a district this month, um, I would like to welcome Oak Cook to our meeting. Oak is a senior at Orange High School. Their pronouns are they, them. And a few weeks ago, I attended Mr. Mitchell's um, theater production or Mr. Mitchell's theater classes production of the Renter Net. And is that the right way to say it, Oak? Okay. Um, and I saw Oak's play and I was so moved by it and inspired and just knew it was a voice that would be wonderful for our board meeting. And I am so excited Oak accepted the invitation to join us tonight. So welcome Oak. And um, they will introduce a play and um, then we will have an opportunity to watch it. So hello. Hi, hello. Uh, it's wonderful to be here and to be able to share my uh, work with everyone. Um, I am a trans non-binary person and for very many years I've been trying to navigate both my perception of myself and uh, living in a world where my perception of myself isn't exactly normal and people don't exactly see me the way that I see myself. Uh, so I created this piece for our theater show uh, about two weeks ago. And um, yeah, I'm really excited to share it with everyone. So yeah. Great, Dr. Felder, are you able to play that? I am not, but Miss Stowe is. Perfect. Or Mr. Jones. We will get that set up. Melanie, you have present presentation rights now. Oh, good evening. And my apologies. I, I don't have access to this video and it, I believe it would need to have been uploaded pre ahead of time. Is that correct, Mr. Jones? Yes, we need to make sure it's in a certain format. Um, I am, I don't want to move on without presenting this. So I'm going to call a five minute recess to work through the technology and then we're going to play it. So give us just a moment, everyone. Mr. Jones, whoever has me. this video, could they please email it to me? Did you find it, Mrs. McKenzie? Oh.
Okay, it looks like we are queued up. Thank you everyone for your patience and we can play it now. Just under share file. It's just under share file. Okay. We can. Clearly I was mistaken that it was ready, but we are committed to getting this. So everyone, please bear with us a couple more minutes. I'm so sorry.
Mr. Schofield is uploading the video and we'll let you guys know when it's ready to, to uh, stream, but it should be shortly. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Hey, we're ready to give this another shot. Thank you. Fingers crossed. <laughs> We need the volume. Uh, we need the audio. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be picking up the audio. Let me try a different method. I have a workaround, just bear with me. Can you hear the video? No. 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 Now? Can you turn it up? I don't, I'm sure. That's as far as I can go with the volume. Joe, I think the video is buffering and the audio is suffering as a result of it. Oh, uh, I see. My conversion didn't pick up the sound for whatever reason. All right, just tell me you want or we can move on. I can keep trying if you'd like. No, we it. don't want to move on. No, we want we okay. want to show this. So I'm wondering, Mr. Atherton, do you think that you can help um, kind of set up playing it the way that you were discussing before? Okay, thank you. Joe, please send me the file. Okay. Mr. Jones, the file has been sent.
that that must be the one that's missing.
It came out as trans in the 70s. I decided at that moment that I was a man. Strictly that. From one end to the other. But that part of me never left. My favorite color was always going to be pink. I still love him.
Mr. Jones, are we ready? I don't think so. I was trying something else. I'm going to try, but uh, I'm not sure about the audio again still. Thank you, Oaks, so much. It was absolutely worth the wait. And I hope that this was a metaphor for all of us, that when something tough comes up, we're gonna stick through to it. We're gonna stick through it. We're going to affirm our LGBTQIA plus staff, students, and community. Thank you, Oaks, so much. Thank you, family, for being here. Yeah. Thank you for bearing with us through this very ridiculous saga that ended in such a beautiful piece. And I know that is um, sharing a piece of your heart with us and that takes a lot of bravery. So thank you so much. Let's give it up one more time for Oak. Oak. Thank you. Okay. Um, and with that, I believe Dr. Fowder, is it right? We will move into agenda adoption now. Okay. Um, we, Dr. Fowder and I were sort of looking through the agenda to see if we needed to tweak anything after our technical difficulties. Um, do you have suggestions for us before we adopt tonight's agenda? I know that we will keep yes um, school renaming committee Juneteenth we, resolution yes. will keep Native American representation yes. with Ms. Claire Stewart. Uh, we had the graduation update. Okay, so we can take that off. Right. Uh, budget recommendation updates. We'll keep. We, we'll need to keep facility use fees. Keep. Uh, we can save uh, online academy and summer scholars. 
uh, provide an update in the weekly update and then on the 20 at the next meeting on the 28th. And then the policies, um, if we think we can still keep those on, you may want to or not. Um, I would like to keep policy 4316. Does anyone else have a pol any policies they feel like they want to get done tonight? I don't think there are any that are absolutely critical um, that you have to have tonight. We can certainly, I mean, we're prepared, but it, it's up to, to the We board. can put it in the yeah, weekly we can... update. Okay, yeah, the only thing I had for that one, and I wrote it down mm -hmm. as I was sitting down looking at the calendar, Sunday calendar for morning call, which is a half of the that we also do. If we could put that in yeah, the we can. Okay. Absolutely. So is everyone okay with what we talked about and just leaving policy 4316 for the policy update? Um, do I have a motion to adopt, adopt that amended agenda? Okay, so why don't we just leave that on there too then? Oh, oh, okay. Well, then we can, you can pull anything off of the consent agenda when we get there. Okay. Why don't we just leave? Why don't we just leave policies on the agenda? Okay, we'll just leave policies on the agenda. Very good. Um, with that, do I have a motion to approve the adopted agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Nays. Motion passes. Agenda is adopted. I do not believe we have any public comment this evening, but let me check my spreadsheet just to make sure that we have not. Um, Ms. Stowe, I'm having a little bit of difficulty. Can you um, confirm for me that no one has signed up since the beginning of the meeting? Oh, here we go. This is Todd. There are no additional uh, people that have signed up. That's correct. Fabulous. Thank, thank you. We love to hear from the public, but that will get us moving tonight. Um, the next item on our agenda is the consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve with the revised personnel as discussed in closed session? And Ms. Hauser, did you have one you wanted to yeah, take off? Okay, so um, do I have a motion to approve with 4020 coming next? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone oppose? Okay. Um, the consent agenda has passed. We will move to policy 4020, and I believe that would be Ms. Cunningham Brown. Did you turn your microphone on? Um, my question is is simple. There's a there's a point. It's in the uh, paragraph three on parental communication and conferences, and it talks about uh, um, when the school talks to the parent, and it um, talks about sharing the students' grades um, and suggests things that the parent could do at home. But it doesn't say anything about what the school will do for the students. So I wondered if that would if there's a reason that was left out or if that should be added to the policy. It is. Ms. Cunningham Brown. Uh, I'm good sorry. Oh, good evening. I think this is a, a, a this is from the policy committee on the consent agenda. First reading the backlog policies. Is that correct? Parental support. It is. Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you for that, uh, Ms. Hauser. And this is the policy, and I noted in the agenda that we will be coming back at your next meeting with two additional policies that we do not currently have that will better detail um, specifically Title I schools and our responsibilities. So this is specifically the par parental support piece. And there are two new policies we don't currently have that will take what we pulled and we'll incorporate that and then some. Okay, so, but was that just title? I would think on any parental conference, 
that we would want the school to be talking about things the school would do or the district would do to support the student. So it just would be a, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, That's correct. I'm sorry. One, one of them is a Title I policy specific and the other is specific to what we do in general. Okay, very good. Thank you. So do I have a motion to approve these updates to policy 4020? So moved. So, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, policy 4020 has passed. Update. The next item on our agenda is an update from the school renaming committee. They are here with recommendations for renaming Cameron Park and Stanford Middle School. Welcome. So thank you, uh, Chair McKenzie. And um, so if we can advance to the next slide, please. All right, so action item 10 in the board's equity resolution calls for the names of buildings in the district to be examined for their origin and compliance with the board's equity policy 1030. Specifically, action item 10 in the board's equity resolution calls for the district to review the names of buildings in our district to examine their origin and compliance with policy 1030. Each school-based equity team took on this task through the lens of six areas that are noted in the resolution to ensure alignment to the board's equity policy 1030. Um, per the school-based equity team's findings on February 8th, uh, 2021, the board voted to rename Cameron Park Elementary. At the February 22nd, 2021 board meeting, the board voted to rename CW Stanford Middle School and requested a process and timeline for renaming both schools. Names for consideration were submitted by an online portal and one committee was formed comprised of 18 people representing a diverse group of parents, school-based staff, central office staff, students and community members. And two meeting facilitators were identified. Uh, the committee met six times to discuss and come to consensus on two to three names to present to the board for consideration for each school. Those names will be presented tonight. Um, but first, I'd like to give uh, the meeting facilitators an opportunity to provide more context around those six meetings. So tonight, uh, joining us are Will uh, Duhausen, uh, Training Director, uh, and Maggie Chotas. Group Facilitator Director with the Dispute Settlement Center. Uh, they will provide that context for us now. Great, and thank, thank you so much, Dr. Felder. Good to see you again, um, board members. It's uh, not been all that long, I suppose, just a couple of days. Um, if we could go ahead and um, skip forward um, to the next page. We had six meetings with the committee, um, and I know both Maggie and I came uh, away um, just so impressed by the uh, committee as a whole, by the um, the serious uh, nature in, in which they took their charge and carried it out, and, and the way that they were able to establish values and collaborate over those six meetings. Six was a couple more than we initially um, scheduled for. And we had some really, really positive, deep conversations. We started off back there at the end of April, and we had sort of a whole meeting for the committee to sort of get to know each other, to understand their charge, their scope, and to establish some values from the group. We started after that with um, really three meetings that we dedicated to um, renaming. Um, Cameron Park Elementary School. At the first meeting, they shared names and their rationale and research from each one, and we spent um, the next two meetings discussing that rationale and research and narrowing the list down to the names that you're going to hear from Maggie here in just a minute. Then we spent two meetings um, uh, renaming the middle school uh, using the exact same process. I think it's uh, noteworthy that we use the same process and the same committee for both schools. Um, and like I said, uh, I think both Maggie and I and our our, our, um, our partner at work, Val, as well, um, um, came away just uh, uh, really impressed with the, the time, the effort, the compassion, and the care for, for the district and its students that, that, that the committee um, expressed. I'm going to allow uh, Maggie to um, comment a little bit on uh, the names that the committee came up with and pass it over to her. 
um, and uh, a little bit about some of the reasoning behind those names. It's good to see you all again. Hi, everybody. It's good to be with you tonight. Um, if you could advance the slide, please. Um, there were, you can see the names that were um, that were forwarded by the the school renaming committee for the elementary school. They decided upon River Park or Arbor Park, and both of those names had been surfaced through the public input prior to the committee's work, and they were championed by committee members in the in the committee process. Some of the rationale for those names were um, there were wishes expressed to keep the word park in the name of the school due to the diversity of trees on the grounds, which many feel are part of the school's identity. Parks are happy places and there is a park nearby the school. Uh, River Park links everything to the diversity of Hillsboro and Arbor represents the diversity of trees planted near the school. In terms of the middle school, the three names that they are forwarding to you, Orange Middle, Hillsborough Middle, or Poplar Middle, both Orange Middle and Hillsborough Middle were surfaced via public input prior to the committee's um, starting and then were championed by committee members. Orange Middle was, the rationale for that was because the middle school and because the middle and the high school share more than just a, a bus parking lot, staff and students from each school support one another with activities and more. And there was a vision that it could be an orange campus. Poplar Middle School was, um, uh, the rationale there was because the majority of the trees on the campus are poplars and Hillsboro, Hillsboro for obvious reasons because of the town of Hillsboro. So those were some of the, well, those were the rationales that were identified by the school renaming committee for you to consider. And as Will said, they worked really hard, very committed to the process and um, just they were phenomenal. Thank you, Will and Maggie, so much for being here and for presenting that. We are, I know I can speak for the board that we are deeply grateful to both of you and to everyone who served on those committees. We know that it was not easy work to try to come to consensus with names like this. So um, we just appreciate all the effort to get the board to this point. And um, I will open the floor to the board for questions, comments, et cetera. Um, Ms. Doyle, don't forget your mic. Oh, you got it. I got it. Thank you. Uh, yes, I thank you to um, Will and Maggie and also to the committee. I enjoyed listening in to um, a meeting and listening to some of the recordings afterwards. It's really nice how that was all available. And I appreciate the, um, the discussions. I would also like us to be able to consider um, Dr. Kismikia Corbett um, as a name for one of the schools. Um, she is probably our most famous Orange County School student, um, having also spent two summers interning at UNC with the SEED program. She represents um, taking advantage of opportunities that our STEM programs offer. Um, I read that she dreamed at 16 of having her own lab and she's, um, mm -hmm. that, that is where she is at today. She, she's been heavily involved in mentorship, outreach to the African American community. Um, we recognize many of these things about her in our resolution that we passed earlier. And um, as she goes on to um, become faculty at Harvard's T.H. Chan um, School of Public Health, um, she comments that um, that, that school is at the forefront of advancing health equity, um, which she is a champion of. And uh, the dean of the faculty there says that she is a natural fit. Her success in the lab is matched only by her commitment to using science to improve people's lives, especially for communities that have too often been left behind by advances in healthcare. I just feel like this has been such an exceptional year. She is such an exceptional person. Um, and these things coinciding that we have the opportunity to um, 
kind of mark this uh, momentous time with the, the um, scientist who has um, contributed so significantly to leading us out of this pandemic with the uh, Moderna vaccine that she led. Um, I would really like us to take the opportunity to consider her name for one of the schools. Thank you for sharing your thoughts, Ms. Doyle. Do other board members, Ms. Hauser? I, I just, I know that, doc, I mean, Dr. Corbett, of course, is, is a, something that we should be extremely proud of. I know that her name was submitted for both schools, and I'm curious as to why the committee decided not to use her name. Will or Maggie, could either of you speak to that? Um, sorry. I, I think the um, committee was very um, deliberate about um, not using an individual or a groups or a, just being very thoughtful about not naming it after an individual. They really wanted something. I mean, there were there was a lot of um, support for, um, you know, for different people. But they just felt like following the board's policy. I, I that was my sense of it. Will may have a different take on it. But um, following the board's policy about not naming a school after an individual um, was one that they wanted to ultimately abide by. I, I I would echo that, and it is a name that came through in the public process, which I think is just kind of speaking to the facts here. And it uh, it is a name that came up, but um, I think um, I would. Just co-sign uh, what what Maggie said is I think um, the reasoning was to not use the name of 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 any person and um, um, that's sort of how that came about. Okay, thanks for that. Um, my suggestion to the board is that we you know continue to have a broad conversation about all of the names and then sort of at the end let's um, talk about everything that's been on the table. So. Um, if that works for everyone, I'm just going to reopen it to all the names for discussion. I don't want to turn it into just a conversation about Dr. Corbett, though I can certainly understand the merit of considering it, and I can understand concerns about naming it after a person. So, Ms. Smiley? Um, just if I could make one more comment on that fact. Um, I really appreciate that the committee wanted to follow along with the board's policy. Um, the board, um, I think, made clear when we were doing the charge that we were very open to considering names and to considering waiving policy, which I think would take like a super majority of the board or something like that in order to do. And so that we were we were open to that. Um, one thing on my mind as we think about this is that policy, I think, is only a couple of years old. And prior to that policy, we named schools after several men. Um, and there are no schools named after women in this district. And so if we always kept to the policy, that would always be true. Um, and so um, I'll just put that out there as something that I'm thinking about is just appreciation that they stuck with that. And I think the board's intent was to signal that we were open to a broader set of names. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Miley. And just to respond to that, I think the committee definitely knew that and they heard that from the board that that policy could be waived. Um, I mean, you know, a recommend they could send a recommendation to y'all that wasn't specifically, you know, bound to the policy as it. So just to let you know, they, they did have that information. Thank you. Other board members, any comments about names generally? No. Um, I'll Stevens, a, yes, well, Stevens. I, I certainly support Ms. Dole's um, recommendation because this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. We, you know, we won't get a, uh, a scientist of color coming from Northern Orange, you know, every year. That's just not gonna, out there helping to save the world. That's just not going to happen. I certainly understand. Um, the, the committee are holding hard and fast to the rules, but a lot of times we hold hard and fast to the rules because and the women always get left out. <laughs> anyway, but so to this popular, I will say that when I looked at the, the, the names here, orange would be difficult with the colors being blue. I, you know, I thought about that. And if we all have 
thought about PMS and, and what that would do for middle schoolers. <laughs> so we would just add a little something in there, you know? Yeah, one thing we had talked about is the possibility of, um, you know, we, we, several of us had just sort of laughed that PMS would probably be very popular at middle schools, athletic events with posters and such. So we know that the name Hill had been a part of the conversation with the renaming committee. So I was wondering if maybe when we made a recommendation of what we wanted to hear public feedback from, maybe Poplar Hill or Poplar Forest, just something that captures the spirit of the work the renaming committee did, but um, maybe avoids that acronym. Um, so, yeah, other board members. Or Poplar Ridge. Yeah. I like Cedar Ridge, Poplar Ridge. Yeah, that's nice. Um, Ms. Miley? Um, the one other thing I'll say is, you know, our renaming policy also has a section about not renaming something, uh, not naming two things that could be easily confused. And so we do have, you know, obviously Hillsborough Elementary and Orange High School. And I know that that was part of the discussion. I watched most of the videos of the of the committee. So I know that they also did consider that. Um, and so I'm just noting that um, I think, you know, Orange High School, everyone calls it orange, you know, and so that would um, take some adjustment. Um, but I'm just generally, I know we're going to have um, community feedback um, sessions, and I'm just open to hearing what people say about all of them. Just wanted to name that as sort of another dimension of this that's on my mind. I want to add in also with um, Hillsborough Middle School, what my concern is, is that we have Hillsborough Elementary School that's a magnet school. And I have concern that folks are going to hear Hillsborough Middle School and think that the magnet program feeds into the middle school. And I would just really hate for that to confuse families in terms of um, the opportunities. Oh, excuse me, the opportunities available here. So I'm just putting that on the table as a concern um, also. And, uh, you know, to, to Sarah's point about how it is said that we should we should consider names that wouldn't be easily confused. Well, clearly, the boards prior to us didn't take that under consideration because Stanford and Stanbeck are always confused because they stand, stand, stand. <laughs> and so uh, I just want to say the board didn't take that into consideration uh, back then. So they so that means they're always sort of waiting to suit whatever situation. Because I do, I've been around here a while, and people always get those stands confused. I think I, Dr. Felly got it confused one time because when she just got to town, it was it, it was a tell you how. <laughs> so it, it was just but you know, it's just too it's too close. <laughs> Other board members, <laughs> Mr. Atherson. So, um, so I'll first say that um, I personally have concerns with naming it after a person. The actual policy does say the board can go in and recognize individuals in there either through, you know, statutes or things like that. And I, I do have concerns that there are many people in our community that have spent lifelong improvements in our community and. I'll throw one out there. I'm not suggesting us do that. Dr. Rainey, she has spent countless hours, lifetimes in our community. And, you know, how do we gauge all of those? I personally don't think we should name a school after somebody. I think we should take these individuals and recognize them in our schools. So people come in and they see, you know, several people that have uh, made an impact not only in our community, but in the world. And that is a centerpiece as people walk in, and we can do that. Um, you know, I, I have an appreciation for the committees, you know, going through and looking at all the names. And I think, you know, uh, Polar Ridge, River, you know, whichever I think is good suggestions as well. Um, but I just have concerns with um, doing that. Thank you, Mr. Atherton. Ms. Hauser? Yeah, I, I just want to support Mr. Atherton's comments because um, I do worry that as soon as we pick someone, 
that we've just dismissed people who have made incredible contributions to our community and our schools. And there are other ways that we can honor Dr. Corbett with a science lab or a scholarship or something, because I think we should find a way to recognize her. But naming a school, you know, then there's, there's, we don't have a policy about um, naming schools after people who are living. So there's that, you know, so we don't really have a thought through policy about naming schools after people. I also feel um, we have a, you know, we've asked the committee to do this work. They under, I saw the meetings, they understood the policy and they came back to us with a recommendation. And so I think we need to be respect. I mean, honestly, as committees go, I was astonished by the diversity of perspectives on this group. It was truly an honor to watch them work. And, um, and I hope we would respect the outcomes. Um, on the point on, if I heard correctly, and, and maybe Will and Maggie could correct me, but I heard with Orange Middle School, that the goal was the campuses collaborate now, and it was a way to bring the campuses further together. So it wasn't about confusion, it was about blending. So I just wanna make sure, that's what I heard, um, you know, was the intent of the committee. So um, mm -hmm. I'm curious what the public has to say, but I really am, am um, thrilled with the committee's work and I really appreciate what's been done. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hauser. Are there any other comments? Mr. Atherton? I do have a comment, but not so much on the this this renaming, but I do know we're having public hearings and yes. I did look up the statue and we're supposed to publish that two weeks before in the local newspaper and identify the purpose, the timing, how much each person can speak. How will they join? And I just don't want us to miss that time frame because we won't get it in the news of orange this week, but we can next week and meet the commit. So I just want to make sure we don't miss that. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, our council advised that that wasn't necessary, but I will absolutely circle back and your point is well taken and we certainly want it well published one way or the other. So if yeah. you really want it in the newspaper, I'm sure we can make that happen. Yeah, so. It's General Statute 160D 601A. And it just says if you have a public hearing, that's what's required. So I'll reach out to Eva and ask. Okay. I appreciate that. Any other comments, Dr. Moore? Did you have anything you wanted to share? That relates to development, public hearings, and it wouldn't apply to. Okay, I, I would still say, regardless, we should be, if we're really wanting our community input on our website is not sufficient. So, and then the other aspect of it is, if, is it going to be an in-person? It's public virtual. Hearing? Right, so you will have to notice it. You will have to accept public comment online and, and up to 24 hours after. Um, so you just will need to comply with the remote meeting statute. Great. Thank you. Um, well, I appreciate this lively conversation. Um, I will say at this point, um, you know, I too am interested in hearing about um, what the public thinks about Dr. Corbett. Um, I, I, you know, certainly we would need to consult with her to see if it was something she would even be open to. Um, you know, I, I'm not, you know, clearly none of us are ready to make a decision about anything, but I think that it was one of the top names that got submitted from the public. Um, you know, I, I think we are just at an incredibly special moment in time. So um, I think the best thing to do probably would be to have a motion for what we wanted to receive feedback for for our public hearings. That way we had clarity, we had a board vote for transparency, and we knew how we wanted to move forward with this. Does anyone want to make a motion? I think you're kind of confusing, but you mean like make a motion to move like Poplar Ridge Middle School forward? Or like, or what? what do we want to, I just, uh, I think sometimes for clarity, it's helpful to have a motion. So like, I wonder if there would be a motion to see 
um, if we wanted public, uh, if we wanted to get public hearing about River Park and Arbor Park during our Cameron Park, okay. or um, you know, Orange High School, Hillsborough High School, some version of Poplar mm -hmm. Middle School and Dr. Corbett Middle School. Um, you know, I'm just throwing things out there. If if I just think that we should come to a consensus on what we want to hear from the public. I'll make a motion um, to that. What I'll make a motion that we can we go back to the previous slide so I can make sure I get the names right. <laughs> Um, that for um, the public hearings, we will um, listen to feedback about um, the options River Park Elementary School, Arbor Park Elementary School for Cameron Park Elementary School, and Orange Middle School, Hillsborough Middle School, Poplar. Do we have to decide on the version of it right now? I would say like Poplar Hill Middle School, since it's Charger Hill, you know, Yeah. Um, and Dr. Kuzmikia Corbett Middle School. Um, that we solicit on all four of those. But I would also like us to verify with her prior to that, actually, whether she she would be open to that, um, even being considered in that way. Okay. Um, so I have a motion, motion from Ms. Smiley. Ms. I'll Doyle. second that motion. The second from Ms. Doyle. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, those who oppose? Okay, motion passes. Thank you all, everyone. Thank you again, um, Maggie and Will, for your leadership. Thank you, Renaming Committee. We um, are truly grateful for bringing the, uh, some direction to us, and um, we look forward to getting public feedback on the 22nd and 23rd. We will make sure to notice that really well. It, you're welcome. And um, Dr. Felder, my request would be that I know we have an online portal for receiving feedback and that we update that to reflect the feedback we're looking for also. Ms. Hauser? Do you want to turn your mic on so folks can? No, that's okay. Uh, I would like confirmation that of our estimates to rename the schools is, are now $200,000. Is that correct? And I would like that to be part of the public so the public is aware of that so that we can receive that, comment on that as well. Okay, that's public information for sure. So, okay, okay. thank you, Ms. Hauser. Um, the next thing on our agenda is a Juneteenth resolution and Vice Chair Stevens and Dr. Moore will be reading that for us. Whereas Juneteenth is a celebration of the date, June 19th, 1865, when people who were enslaved in Texas were informed that the U.S. government had officially outlawed the brutal practice of slavery three years prior with the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation. And whereas the Emancipation Proclamation issued on January 1st, 1863, declared that the people who were enslaved in Confederate control areas were officially free people. State action was used to abolish slavery in the areas controlled by Union forces, with the exceptions of Kentucky and Delaware, where slavery was finally ended by the 13th Amendment in December 1865. And whereas isolated from both Union and Confederate forces during the Civil War, Texas had become a refuge for those who wished to continue the practice of holding human beings as property. And whereas since the capture of New Orleans in 1862, people who held human beings as property in Mississippi, Louisiana, and other points east had been migrating to Texas to escape the Union Army, Army's reach and more than 150,000 people held in bondage had been moved to Texas and the white people of Texas actively worked to ensure that people held in bondage who should have been freed in 1863 did not hear of the freedom granted by the Emancipation Proclamation. And whereas, although the Emancipation Proclamation was issued January 1st, 1863, there was still a total of 250,000 people held as human cattle, chattel in Texas when U.S. Army General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston, Texas, and on June 19, 1865, Juneteenth proclaimed the war had ended 
And so the captivity of people who had been enslaved and whereas the following is the text of official recorded version of the order. The people of Texas are informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves and the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. The freedmen are advised to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages. They are informed that they will not be allowed to collect at military posts and that they will not be supported in idleness, either there or elsewhere. And whereas, although news of emancipation came at different times during that Texas summer and autumn 1865, African Americans in Texas started to celebrate the freedom of enslaved persons on June 19th, Juneteenth, as their day of celebration. And whereas, beginning in 1866, they held parades, barbecues, and gave speeches in remembrance of their liberation. The oldest of the surviving formerly enslaved people were often given a place of honor and black Texans initially used these gatherings to attempt to locate family members from whom they had been separated. And soon these events became staging areas for family reunions and an opportunity to uplift each other as they moved through hostile environments. And whereas by 1900, Juneteenth had unofficially became Texas Emancipation Day and was sponsored by black churches and civic organizations. Yeah. Whereas with the migration of African Americans from Texas to the West Coast, especially during World War II, Juneteenth grew in the emerging black communities of Los Angeles, San Diego, Oakland, California, Portland, Oregon, and Seattle, Washington. And whereas activists in the 18, 1980s began to advocate for wider recognition of the Juneteenth holiday and whereas Texas became the first state to make Juneteenth a state holiday. And whereas by June, 2020, 47 states and the District of Columbia had established either full or partial recognition of the holiday. Only Hawaii, North Dakota and South Dakota have not. And whereas Juneteenth is the oldest nationally celebrated commemoration of ending slavery in the United States, and whereas Juneteenth has been declared a paid holiday by the governing bodies of Orange County, Town of Chapel Hill, Town of Carborough, Town of Hillsboro, Orange County Schools, and the Chapel Hill Carborough City School District. So, whereas the 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution passed by Congress on January 31st, 1865 and ratified by the required 27 of the then 36 states on December 6th, 1865 and proclaimed on December 18th, 1865, abolished slavery and involuntary servitude except as punishment for a crime. And whereas we recognize that while the Emancipation Proclamation in the 13th Amendment may have officially ended the legal practice of enslaving human beings in the United States of America, 156 years later, there is still progress which must be made to dismantle the insidious systems and practices which continue to harm black people and deny us access to the rights and resources to which we are entitled. So therefore be it resolved that we, the Orange County Schools Board of Education collectively stand with the black indigenous and people of color known as BIPOC elected officials honoring the perseverance and hope <clears throat> that inspired African Americans to celebrate freedom, to look for lost relatives, and to thrive in a hostile and white supremacist environment. Recognize Juneteenth as an important date in American history and 
Furthermore, we will honor their legacy by building a more equitable future for our children, our children's children, and their children. And we will continue to advocate the work to that end. Adopted on the seventh day of June, 2021. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do I have a motion to approve? So move. Second. I have a motion from Ms. Doyle and a second from Ms. Smiley. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Our resolution passes. Thank you again, Dr. Doyle and Vice Chair Stevens for, I mean, excuse me, Dr. Moore <laughs> and Vice Chair Stevens for reading that for us. Um, the next item on our agenda this evening is a presentation called Native American Representation, Accuracy and Authenticity. Tonight, we welcome Ms. Kara Stewart, who is an enrolled member of the Saponi Tribe as our presenter. She is the current literacy specialist at Eflin Cheeks Global Elementary and has been an educator for over 20 years. Ms. Stewart was North Carolina's 2020 American Indian Teacher of the Year, and she regularly publishes articles in the School Library Journal as an, and is an expert in evaluating culturally appropriate and historically accurate library materials that affirm Native students' identity. Ms. Stewart has served a number of terms on the North Carolina State Advisory Council on Indian Education and is an educational consultant on her tribal council. She received the, North, the University of North Carolina's 2015 Community Diversity Award. We are incredibly lucky to have her as a part of Orange County Schools and we are equally lucky to have her here with us tonight. Welcome, Ms. Stewart. Thank you so much for being here. Hi. Hi, thank you so much. Thanks for that introduction. Um, will I be able to sh share my screen and do my presentation remotely? Mr. Jones? Aha. Uh -huh. Got it. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So let me click that little share button there. All right. So while we're waiting for that to come up, I um, just want to say good evening to everyone. And I appreciate this opportunity to be here so much. And to the board in particular, I want to thank you um, for the time that you've invested in me and listening to me and considering the information that I've been presenting to you so far. Um, and here's more to come. So let's see if I can get this presenting the correct way. Uh, Stuart, if you just, somebody be able to look. If you can just click the present button in the upper right, I think then you'll have the full screen. Oh, you Looks mean on good. my presentation? Yeah. Okay. Looks good? Yes, indeed. Sure does. Thank you. Thank you so much. So if you weren't able to um, watch the videos of the last couple presentations, sessions one and two, I'm just going to give you a really fast overview. Session one, we talked about um, the tribes in North Carolina, the official state recognized tribes in North Carolina. Um, and the difference kind of between federally recognized and state recognized. We talked about the commonalities between the tribes. We talked about tribes as non-static, moving frequently between particularly North Carolina and Virginia. Um, and we talked about Indian schools in North Carolina and, and what, they, what they were like, really. Um, session two, I gave you all... Um, my interpretation of, of when I was thinking through the historical climate and the educational impact that would have my representation of foundations of academic success. And in my head, it was just kind of, it made sense to base it on a medicine wheel. So starting on the left, which is west, the place of introspection, um, 
identity is self-identity in the black. I believe I am valuable and capable. And tonight we're going to look at one extra little layer to that. And here in the bubble, you can see it. How do I create and keep a positive sense of my identity? How do I create and keep a positive sense of myself? The North and white is also identity. It's society. So this individual, this student has to think that society values me and my people and believes we, we are capable. So all these pieces come together as academic success. In the East, we see in the yellow, this is getting closer to the system, what, what this student or person believes about the system. Um, my learning in school has a purpose that I believe in. That's what they have to believe as a part of that piece of being academically successful. And they would maybe say something a little uh, closer to the mark of, I believe in this larger system and the process of success in my success society. So if you don't believe that, you have less chance of being academically successful. And in red at the bottom is also the system um, but the belief is my school instruction meets my needs and it weaves in my culture throughout the day. And that might be voiced as I believe my schools are set up for my success because those are the things that I need to be successful. So there are the four large overview pieces of academic success. And we'll talk about um, this one over here. How do you create that positive sense of, of identity? Um, session two, we also talked about a lot um, under the umbrella of who tells the history and thinking through pieces of invisibility, trust, and identity. We talked about a lot of um, really deep issues, uh, difficult to talk about issues in history in North Carolina and Virginia. And that climate included things like when did we get voting rights? It included Dr. Plecker, forced sterilization, uh, what the Indian schools were actually like, all of those things. We also mentioned uh, recent invisibility and trust and identity issues like the early COVID-19 statistics that we were other um, Atlantic Coast pipeline that was disbanded not, not because of all the opposition to it from Native tribes that it would affect the most, but because of um, an extinction of one uh, salamander tribe, salamander <laughs> species. So I added in here tonight uh, Rick Santorum's um, line that he said a couple weeks ago, there isn't much native culture in American culture. And so that's another uh, recent spewing of invisibility for native people. And that did not go over well um, in the nationally in the native organizations. We talked about the key role of K-12 teachers in teaching accurately um, because K-12 education about Native people is a key driver and a predictor of Native college applications, attendance, and graduations. And I gave you some research and statistics on that. And then I also gave you some North Carolina and national academic statistics um, for Native students. So tonight, our goals for tonight are talking about Native American representation, accuracy, and authenticity, and we want to come to an understanding of um, what those stereotypes look like, what do they sound like, what is a stereotype about Native people, what does it look like in text, in teaching materials, and then I'll give you a couple of statistics quickly on North Carolina and national statistics for the reasons why those things matter, why that representation accurately matters and why stereotypes matter. And then um, there's a couple things that I wanted to present to you as things that we can do as a district. And my favorite part is the last one at the bottom. It's um, showing you some really fabulous, accurate, authentic text alternatives. So this slide we also had in session two, but the part I want to point out today is um, the little spinny part there, being tribally specific. So that is key. If you think of uh, Native Americans or American Indian people pretty much like Europe and the 
tribes as separate countries. Well, the people from Greece are quite different from the people in England or the people in France or Spain. So we, we need to be tribally specific. There is no generalized Indian person. So if I were to introduce myself, my identity to myself is that I'm Kara Stewart Saponi. And you would see those, uh, it's common to put the parentheses around your tribal recognition. So Kara Stewart Saponi. So I wouldn't say I'm an Indian and I'm from the Saponi tribe. I would be tribally specific. And then we talked about all these things down here, the tribe claiming you. You don't say I am something, something like the, the tribe would know you if you are native um, and being sovereign nations with kind of nation to nation, government to government relationships. So in North Carolina, we do have the North Carolina Commission of India, Indian Affairs. And that is the body that acts as a liaison and as an advocate for all of the tribes throughout the state and who advocates for us um, on a legislative level. So as we think about all those pieces from sessions one and two, and thinking about native representation, representation of Indian people in this session, I kind of thought, you know, we can pretty much summarize that by saying this statement, if I am invisible to you, if you mi misrepresent my identity to others, and even to me, like you're telling me who I am, how am I to trust you? Why should I believe you care? Why should I believe you at all? And why should I learn from you? So many times that's what our native children are feeling. Like if you're telling me I don't exist, which actually did happen to my daughter um, by a professor of American Indian studies when she was at UNC. Um, she, she was told that there was no Saponi tribe. Um, and in fact, it was him who didn't know. So if I am invisible to you, if you misrepresent my identity, if you show pictures of me that I know are wrong and cause cognitive dissonance, and then you're telling others that, and then you even tell me that, do I trust you? Why should I believe you? And we can boil that down to kind of a formula in the brown box at the bottom down here. Session one, session two, our history plus continued invisibility plus continued misrepresentation equals a lack of trust, a lack of buy-in to the system and may, or then it can, lead to lower academic achievement and may and can, lead to a lack of college graduation, which may and can lead to lower lifetime learnings. So this is our why does it matter? And then our thought bubble for this evening, how do I create and keep a positive sense of myself, my identity, um, will reflect that potential that we have for validating or on the other hand, disempowering native identity of your students, of your colleagues. So you have the power of either validating or invalidating, disempowering, depending on how you interact. So this is um, one of my favorite cartoons because it talks about American Indian stereotypes in school and obviously he's thinking of all the things he has learned throughout his life of American Indians uh, all these stereotypes the Pocahontas and all that and she's obviously just told him that she is native or Indian or her tribe and his reaction really you don't look like an Indian and you know her face is exactly correct it's like what because she knows who she is but he doesn't, he has a preset notion of, of who and what she is. So our thought is, do these stereotypes erode this student's own accurate sense of her identity? Do they support and confirm it? And I'm pretty sure y'all would agree they erode it. So this, this type of stereotype about Native people, they prevent us from having that full and accurate and authentic picture of Native people. 
This is another one from like maybe high school, older kids. And I'll just give you a minute to read it. You're native. So it cracks me up. It makes me smile because oh, I can't even tell you how many times I've heard that. Um, I mean, it's funny, but it's not funny. So I think a part of this that's really important to mark here, I've given this so much thought, and this is certainly a developing concept in my brain, but I think part of what's really important for us to recognize is that there is, there is a resistance to changing American Indian stereotypes in the public, in schools, anywhere. And I think a part of that is that the idea that American Indians belong to all Americans, the belief that kind of the belief or the supposition that we are fair game, not really seeing us as a race or real people, um, the idea that all people have Indian in them or all Americans have Indian in them, the concept of, oh, I know somebody who's Indian and they don't mind, or the concept of Indians, the as, as a concept belonging to Americans and as opposed to the reality of the real people whom these stereotypes affect. So it's almost like people don't want to hear about the real people because they are more comfortable and believe more solidly in what they have been taught and handed down for the past 300 years. So we've got to at some point break that cycle. And that's what I'm trying to express to you tonight as how to start doing that within our system. So inaccurate K-12 education does lead to the continuation of those stereotypes. From session two, we had touched on research on the K-12 education as being the most important to setting what people believe about American Indians. So then that leads to, those stereotypes lead to a cycle of identity erosion, invisibility, a lack of trust in the system, and lower academic achievement, all under that historic perspective, genocide, systemic racism in society that prevents a lot of people from achieving as much as their peers. So I think that whole concept of, oh, but you belong to all of us, I think sometimes that's, that's how it starts or how it is continued. To break that down even further, I'm giving you research here from the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, inaccurate and negative media depictions have psychological consequences. For example, exposure to Sorry, exposure to common media portrayals has been shown to have a harmful impact on Native American high school students' feelings about themselves, their community, and their academic possibilities. Media depictions of Native Americans can influence how Native people see themselves. So this next part we touched on with another article in session two. Some may be motivated to identify with representations even if they are inaccurate, in other words, some people want to identify with a stereotype because it is better to have one representation than none, maybe, or maybe for other reasons. Maybe they feel insecure about their own identity, or maybe they feel like they've been having to prove it so many times that they will just embrace the stereotype to, to prove to people that this is who they are. But I mean, I do think it's important that you understand that there are um, in different influences and different reasons why some Native people might identify with the stereotypes. And at the bottom in green, the author suggests that policymakers, that would be you, support making schools free from limiting and negative representations that influence the future potential of Native American students. And I just want to add to that that. Um, it doesn't just influence the future potential of Native American students, it miseducates all non-Native Americans also. So it miseducates them and therefore the cycle continues. 
So I have two videos for you here. I'm going to try to play um, this first one on the top with Adam Beach, the CNN interview. It's only like a minute long. The other one uh, I'm going to leave. It's about six minutes long. I'm going to leave that for um, board members for you to watch on your own. Um, that does have a little bit of a language warning in it. So let me see if I can get this um, video to hear the sound. Somebody needs to tell me if you don't hear the sound and I'll just move on and, and we'll let you watch it later. But if you do hear the sound, um, how do I create and keep a positive sense of myself? That's what you're thinking. I'm sorry, streaming uh, videos directly from YouTube will will not play audio. Okay. All right, let's move on. But if you all would listen to those videos, they're really good. They explain a lot of things about um, stereotypes. All right, so let's move on. Thank you for letting me know. So here is an entire page of um, images of American Indians in popular in, in the public, consumer goods, all that kind of thing. So as you're looking at these, um, I want you to think of just a couple of words to end this sentence. And it's most effective if you jot it down on um, a sticky note. But if you don't have one, you can kind of hold it in the back of your head. So as you look at these images of American Indians, I want you to think American Indians are. And I'll just give you like 10 seconds to jot a couple of words down. Okay, as you look at this one, you can see that it's not just in the past, you know, it's not just old products that used to be on the shelves by any means. Um, there are contemporary things, all in fashion, media, all that kind of thing. So I want you to think on this one, American Indian women are, and if you have any other additions to American Indians are, go ahead and add those to your uh, thoughts that you're remembering or to your sticky note. So as you wrote those down, think for a minute, that you're a native person or a native student? How do I create and keep a positive sense of my identity, myself as a capable, valuable person in the face of all of those? And now we have one, um, this is a pizza chain in Ireland. It might even be in Scotland and England now, I don't know, but it is definitely in Ireland. And the yellow arrows, it's Apache pizza. The yellow arrows point to the name of the pizza. And I just wrote them bigger down here for you. So in their mind, American Indian equals Buffalo, Wigwams, Apache, Hiawatha, Big Chief, and Moonshine. So somehow selling pizza equates with all these American Indian things, e even across the world. And in Germany, there are also a huge number of stereotypes and even an entire culture built around um, a misunderstanding of American Indians. And so one more time, American Indians are, and we're looking at the teepee, we're looking at the product labels. American Indians are. And I know I'm going through this kind of quickly. It's probably because you're all falling asleep because it's late. So in light of that one uh, slide that particularly had the fashion on it, I do want you to know that this year, Governor Cooper did declare May 5th, 2021, a day of awareness for missing and murdered Indigenous women. And so to pick a couple of places apart in that, uh, resolution. American Indians and Alaska Natives are almost three times more likely to experience violent crimes and at least two times more likely to experience rape or sexual assault crimes than other races. It's a pretty large statistic. 
In some tribal communities, indigenous women face murder rates that are roughly 10 times the national average. 84% of indigenous women, that's an estimate from the National Institute of Justice, experience violence in their lifetime. And North Carolina does have around 90 unsolved cases of missing and murdered indigenous women and children dating back to 1994. So thinking through that a little bit, pulling it out nationally, here are some national statistics on missing and murdered indigenous women. Four out of five nationally are affected by violence. Here's that same statistic from the US Department of Justice. Homicide is the third leading cause of death among 10 to 24 year years of age and the fifth leading cause of death for American Indian Alaska Native women between 25 and 34. So these are some pretty, um, and this was pre-COVID. So this is some pretty um, harrowing statistics. And just so you know, um, around 75 to 80% of Native people do not live on a reservation. So in light of all of that, let's say you're an Indian woman or a teen girl, how do you create and keep a positive sense of your identity, yourself as a capable, valuable person? So, okay, let's forget the um, consumer products. Let's go to school, school materials. Um, the one at the bottom left, all about my chosen tribe, this is one that was mailed to me from another district in North Carolina. Um, I, I answer this kind of email for my tribe about students looking for help um, with information about my tribe. So this was emailed to me and it was from a, a county in, in the East. Starts out okay, what is the name of your tribe? What region of the United States does your tribe live in? What does the region your tribe lives in look like? And suddenly, what natural resources did they have? What type of transportation did they use? Oh, all right, so we're extinct now, gotcha. What type of homes did they live in? So it started out okay, but it, it turned into, and then here we have another image of an American Indian right on the paper that the um, teacher handed out for the project. If we look up here at the top left, I sleep in a teepee. That's part of the um, kindergarten and first grade resources. This one happened to be from Teachers Pay Teachers, but honestly, you find them everywhere. And this, what is this? Native American Indians? What is that? That's not a term. You're either Native American or you're American Indian. You're not all three. Like, I don't understand that term. Going to the right, top right, we have more um, representations that are stereotypical. And oh, look, here's somebody in a big headdress standing blowing, blowing a flute. So then we have behind it here, all this stuff about regions. And again, this is something I just, I just don't understand why, why it's not tribally, tribally specific by any means and it needs to be. So instead of saying, oh, we're gonna study Plains cultures or we're gonna study Indians of the Southeast, I'm not sure why you can't say, we're gonna study the Mandan and the Apache or we're gonna study the, the Seminole and, or we're gonna study these eight North Carolina tribes. I'm not, this is a totally false framework, the Pacific North, Northwest, they're, they're like there isn't anything like that. So not in Indian culture, not when you're trying to find out specific and accurate information. If you wanna study geology and geography alone, sure, but then leave the Indians out of it. So here again, we have the stereotypical images on all of them, all set in the past. And again, on the yellow one, the Native American Indian, I don't know what that title means, activities and printables. So students will locate regions, describe the region's shelter, clothing, food, match regions. There's nothing about specific tribes. And I did go into this one, this lesson and look at it, and there was nothing about specific tribes. So here we are with some school um, material. So let's look at books. Maybe the books get better from schools. These are kind of older books right here. He saw Indians, bears, and Eskimos. 
imitating Indians. And here I see noses every place. And so the Indian is there because he has a big nose. And on a personal note, I want to tell you that um, a couple of years ago when I was putting up a display um, about um, North Carolina American Indians in my school, I somebody did say to me, oh, I didn't know you were Indian. I'm Indian too. You can tell by my big nose. That was actually something that was said to me. Um, here again, we see the Indians just sitting down, um, smoking a peace pipe. Looks like they're quite relaxed as the dog is Indian. And all the other people are up and around or doing things and we're just sitting there smoking. So, okay, let's see what happens with some more books. All these images again, you know, there, there's just no need to include stereotypical images and they're all passing along the same inaccurate information about Native Americans and none of them are tribally specific. So then we go to some more modern books. And again, we find that a lot of them are not tribally specific, but even if they are, even if they mention a tribe, um, these books are not necessarily accurate when, and they're not even necessarily pictured on the cover as, as anything you would know is anything about an Indian in it that's inaccurate. So therefore we have to analyze the books that we give to children and the materials, the teaching materials that we give to children, that we give to students. And so this creates, you can't, because you can't tell from the covers. So again, all in our school materials, again, public materials, teacher resource materials, books, how do I keep and create a positive sense of my identity, myself as a capable, valuable person when I see all those images around me? So again, history and continued invisibility plus misrepresentation is a lack of trust in the schools. It equals lack of buy-in to the system, which can lead to lower academic achievement, which can lead to not graduating from college, which can lead to lower lifetime learning. So I've got a quick quiz for you. Let's look at, I want you to look at the row on the top, sign of the beaver, Indian in the cupboard, if you live with the Iroquois and stone fox, all books that are in probably all of our elementary schools, except for mine because we weeded. Um, so what, take a look, what do you notice about the covers, about the people on the covers, about the Native American representation? What do you notice about them? You can just jot it down or keep it in your head. And I made this um, cover for Sign of the Beaver larger so that you could see the two characters in it better. And here we are here. And here. I know I'm going quickly. And then in row two, again, look at the characters here. And what do you notice in these books? Hopefully, when you finish these sentences, American Indians are, oh, look, they're brutal and they're savages. These don't exactly look friendly. In Stone Fox, the um, white child looks certainly afraid of the Indian chasing him. We have a knife in the hand here, and here on the blow up, we could see that um, the white child looks quite unsure of himself next to the native boy. These are all books that are very stereotypical, not just on the covers, but in the uh, words inside of them. These on the bottom are all books by native authors, and you notice that they are friendly and smiling. They are contemporary. They talk about real people, it, not in feathers and headdresses. Um, and these are historically accurate, even if they are fiction. So I'm not gonna stop and, and read this to you now um, in the interest of time. But what I want you to notice as you go back through, I hope you go back through this presentation and, and take advantage of all the links that were here. 
Um, you can read this. These are both from um, the book Bluebirds, which has been quite popular, and it's probably in all of our um, libraries. You will notice how the main character speaks as opposed to how the, the native main character versus the white main character. It's two girls who um, supposedly make friends in, in that time. So now, summarizing all of that up, going back to thinking of all of that, the foundations of academic success, in, at the bottom here, if my school is using classroom library, guided reading room, book room, media center books like we just saw, or if my teachers are giving me assignments and projects like we just saw, does my school meet my needs in the bottom? Would I, as a native child, believe that my school is set up for my success? Would it help me to create a positive sense of myself and what I'm capable of? So books are those images in words. All these images, the fashion things, all of this, books have all of those words inside them that represent exactly the stereotypical disaster that you see in front of you now. So I have come up with five questions that we can ask ourselves, and this is what I present to um, media specialists and literacy, literacy specialists and uh, in different places in order to get people to think about what we are giving to students as material. The number one question is, what do we want all people to come away feeling or knowing about American Indians from this material? Is the material humanizing or dehumanizing to Native people? Does it promote or erode an Indian person's sense of identity? And does it give accurate or inaccurate information? I mean, we are in the business of giving accurate information to students. And also, we need to think about inadvertent teaching. So what is that material teaching, whether it's overtly or inadvertently? Those are the five questions we need to think about. And I'll give you a minute to read this. And that is definitely related to identity and invisibility. And after all of those um, poor representations, I need to, I feel like I need to take a shower, wash all that off, and here are some very accurate representations of Native people. So I want you to jot down again, look at this, and jot down, I don't know, however many words you can think of. These are images of real American Indian Native people, mostly of my tribe, but some not. So American Indians are what? Look at the real deal and finish that sentence. I'll give you a couple minutes to think about that, a couple seconds. And let's go to the next one. Here are some contemporary and diverse role models. And again, finish that sentence. American Indians are, while you are given these representations, these real representations. Now, what do you think we are? Okay, and again, in the interest of time, I'm sorry, I'm moving forward quickly. So, the harm of playing Indian, because you are the Board of Ed, um, and I do have this opportunity, I do feel compelled to briefly point out one harmful practice that is seen in schools everywhere. Um, ours, our school is no, our system is no exception. Um, and you do absolutely have the power to change this. So dressing up as Native people, that is another way to further harmful stereotypes, to pass along and continue harmful stereotypes. So this is including all forms, whether it's a paper headdress or um, adding everybody make Indian names, as you see here in this picture. Um, it, it is a power play. You can dress up to pretend to be us, but can we dress up to pretend to be a stereotype of you? It does objectify Native people. 
it normalizes those stereotypes and and makes people think that you know it's another hammer in the coffin of making people think it's real it dehumanizes native people and it it completely obliterates the trauma that is standing in front of you as a native person so if you are a native person in a class how do you create a positive sense of yourself when faced with this? And just to tell you a brief personal note, when my son was in first grade in Orange County schools, um, this did happen to him. His teacher had the students choose an Indian name. Um, he came to me very upset and he said, but I am Indian and my name is, and then he you know, said his name. So the solution that was decided upon when I um, went to the principal to say, look, this is not acceptable. Let me tell you why. The solution was that he was to come to my room during the time when that classroom did Indians. So he still had to sit in that room the rest of the day with a teepee in it, which is not regionally accurate. And all the other desks had Indian names taped over their real names. So that was about 20 years ago, but I want to tell you, nothing has changed. I saw this very thing last year and the year be before that, nothing has changed. So this 20 more years of furthering and perpetuating stereotypes, you have the power to change that. We talked last time about education being one of the most powerful opinion shaping systems in America and about K-12 education in particular being a key driver of invisibility and false narratives about Native people. We also talked about the foundation that can make the difference for K-12 teachers to be effective and accurate. And one of those things is recognizing the disparity between what you may believe and the real lives of our students. So do we continue to teach and present what we believe in the face of what the students know from their daily lives? That is definitely a cognitive dissonance for the students and the families. And also it's inaccurate teaching for everybody. So there has to be a way for Native students to retain their authentic sense of self and Indigenous identity while receiving that education. So that good solid foundation includes all of these things that we talked about last time. And again, the PD model it, module is a source of that information. Here are the statistics I presented to you last time from North Carolina. And we can see looking at EOG reading, EOG math, white students compared with American Indian students, it looks like Native students are about 25% less capable of learning than their white counterparts. And that looks the same way, whether you're talking national or North Carolina. But we know that's not true. That is not true. So then why do so many of them perform as if they are 25% less capable? because they are invisible to you and because you misrepresent them and their identity to them and to others. So therefore they don't trust you. They don't believe you really care and they don't think they should believe you. And so why should they learn from you? That is essentially the disconnect largely. So what we can do as a district is this up here, tackle the invisibility, tackle the misrepresentation. That is absolutely doable. That is 100% doable. So in the immediate term, do not accept that asterisk of invisibility that we talked about before in data, even if it says zero. Discontinue the practice of dressing up as Indians at Thanksgiving or any other time. Make full use of that module for Board of Ed, Central Services, administrators, teachers, and other staff, as I laid out in the other sessions. Educate your media specialists and literacy coaches about stereotypes in Kid Lit. And this link is a great source of that. They educate about all types of diversities and also American Indian and Alaska Native um, cultures. They also talk about weeding your library and, and how to do it. And, and it's, I just can't stress enough that that is a really good course to take. 
And then the last thing is compiling accurate data for OCS on our Native families and students. So this is a, a little mini breakdown of this course. Top right, this box links to it if you want to find out more. And just to give you a really fast overview of what I do for them, because I do speak for them. I'm a 30 minute speaker on one of their days, but that whole course is like a three day long full day of information for them on, on how to update your libraries, how to include more groups. Um, so just to give you a brief update, you know, we go over how we want all children educated accurately. I go over those five questions with them. Uh, this slide and the next slide, they are actually summarizations of the criteria tool that I give them, and we'll get to the criteria tool in just one second. So this is the things you, I tell them you want to look for in the material, whether it's books or teaching materials that you give or purchase. Here are things that you want to avoid in those materials. <clears throat> and some of this you do have to do by research, and I give them uh, resources to research. And the criteria, and this is just me uh, giving them a screenshot of how to get to it, the criteria, they can link to it right here, and then I work with them on how to do the criteria. It is based on the 1980 um, 10 Quick Ways to Analyze Children's Books for Racism and Sexism. And that was referred to in the ALA and ALSC white papers. Those are really important links because it lets you know that what we are attempting to do in analyzing is 100% necessary and above board. It is not about policing in any way at all. So the use of these training tools, next couple of slides are just me showing them how to get to it on the website. So here is the criteria, and here's my um, paragraph on of explanation for, them, for whoever clicks on that, the State Advisory Council of uh, Indian Education website. Ms. Stewart, you know? yes. yes. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I just am sorry to interrupt, but I just was going to make a motion that we extend the meeting till 10 o'clock. I know we okay. have things to discuss. Thank you. Do we have a second? Okay, second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed? We are in session until 10 o'clock. Thank you, Ms. Doyle. Sorry for the interruption, Ms. Stewart. That's okay. I'm sorry, I'm almost done, I promise. <laughs> no, you take your time. We um, are so <laughs> glad you're here. Please take your time. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, I, I, for the North Carolina State Advisory of Indian Education, I adapted this version for teachers to make it a little easier to follow. Um, so before, before it was loaded up to the State Advisory Council of Indian Education's website, I went to the Oyate website where I got their adaption of the 1981, and I adapted this with a little bit more clarification for teachers and media specialists on how to analyze the books and materials they are presented with. And so part of that analyzation, the yellow arrows are some things that I specifically point out to them, looking for stereotypes, how to know one, looking for loaded words, um, looking at the lifestyles. For instance, are native cultures presented in a condescending manner? Um, things you can look for instead. Uh, looking at the dialogue, looking at standards of success. Are Indian people portrayed as childlike and helpless? Does a white authority figure know better than they do? Um, do Native people in their communities contrast unfavorably with the norm of white middle-class suburbia? So all these are things we talk about and uh, I can work with media specialists about um, to teach them how to use these tools. And again, the starred areas are gonna be your most important areas. What effect is this going to have on a child's self-image? Looking at the author and illustrator's background, are they connected to a tribal culture at all? It's very difficult to find accurate, authentic books in, in which the author is not part of that culture. Now, this is my favorite part. So these are the new books. These are all uh, Native authors. I love all of these books. There are so many choices that can be made instead of continuing to use 
ones that may be problematic. So as you look at these, American Indians are what? Mm -hmm. I like Super Indians, that's a graphic novel up there. And this is the new edition of uh, an Indigenous People's History of the United States for young people. This is great in uh, middle school and high school. It debunks a whole lot of things, all these things. Salty pie is one of my favorites. And again, another page of more fabulous books. These are nonfiction down here. The Frog Mother, The Wolf Mother, The Grizzly Mother, The Sockeye Mother. So good, so good for science. Um, American Indians are, jot it down or get it in your head. And again, American Indians are, Fall in Line Holden. Oh my gosh, that is a crazy good book. That is one book that can be taken from kindergarten all the way up to 12th grade on very different levels. The adult book, of course, they're there. So many good books. And these are the ones that are coming out now. Uh, Sisters of the Never See was just released in June. Firekeeper's Daughter, you may have heard it. She's been on Good Morning America. She's been on every interview so far. This one, Healer of the Mo Water Monster, this is Brian Young. And I shared his video with you on session two at the very end. All of these, Sea and Winter is a beautiful, beautiful middle grade book. Uh, Eric's book, Eric Gansworth's book, Apple Skin to the Core is um, either high school or adult. I'm reading it now and I find it, oh, I have to read it slowly because there are so many truths in it that I need to process. So now looking at your sticky notes or the thoughts in your head with American Indians are, by now you should be able to sort your sticky notes or your words into stereotypical or accurate whether we we're looking at the teaching materials, the public consumer products, the school books, the accurate pictures of my tribe and, and beyond, and these, you should be able to sort your sticky notes and come up with a very different picture in the two groups of what American Indians really are. And I also point out to them that there is now for an imprint of uh, Native American books, a first uh, that came out last year. Well, no, the winter 2021. It's called Heart Drum and links to it. They're, they're all American Indian authors. Um, and then here's some resources that I give to them. And then now back to us, back to the Orange County Schools. This is resources from our session one that I gave you. And I put a star next to the ones that you might want to think about the most. These are from session two. And then session three is up at the top. But then down at the bottom on this session, session three, I did put again these five things because to me, these top five things are going to handle a lot and make a big statement. Tackling invisibility, tackling misrepresentation would say a lot about how much we actually do want to do the work of reaching out to, to our families and to breaking the cycle of stereotypes. And then I added to your resources there, and I think I have everything um, there that would make it easy for you to act on the items. And I will stop there. I know I have a question slide, but we probably don't have time for that. Um, so. Well, first, I just want to say thank you. This is um, really such a gift to be um, a governing body and have you here giving us specific steps. Um, and it's just so powerful. Um, I was really moved by the exercise of um, sort of writing down what the pictures depicted throughout the presentation. And while it was really simple, um, it impacted me um, similarly to the way that I was impacted by some of the exercises um, with REI training. So it was just very effective. Um, and I'm going to stop there, share the floor, but thank, thank you so much. Um, other yes, yes. members? Thank you. Ms. Smiley? Yeah, I just wanted to echo the thanks. There's so much rich additional detail we can get to on our own after this as well. And just really, really appreciate 
um, this gift of your time and expertise. Sure. Ms. Hauser. I actually have a couple of questions. Um, first, I was curious if you um, or these or the state organizations you're with, are you working with DPI and the State Board of Education on the new social studies standards? So I, I was, and we have been. Um, we were a long time ago, and it was it was a long fight to get American Indian um wording put into the standards and then with this last passage it was taken out so i know there has been a little bit of pushback to that and i'm not sure where that stands um okay. so that's a dbi um this state advisory council on indian education is a is a branch of dpi and so we are commissioned through the commission of indian affairs through dpi yes I'll I'll send you something on that. Um, second, if we were willing to commit a budget, and I don't know exactly, um, could you give us recommendations to update our libraries, our school libraries, all of them? Absolutely. Okay. And I'd like the board to consider that as a budget item. That's something that we could do concretely and pretty immediately. And then third, I was curious if you were personally speaking to our students. I'm speaking, yes, I have been speaking to students at Eflin Cheeks ever since I've gotten there and staff. I was curious about like, you know, the seventh grade at Stanford or the, or the high schools. Are you speaking to large student groups about um, the materials you've been sharing with us? No, I have not. Um, and that's because, you know, when, when school is in session, I am teaching. I to work. <laughs> yeah, I'm teaching reading. <laughs> Go well, figure. The, the material is important. The material is important. Yes. So I'd like to, yes. and I don't know, I'd like to make a motion that the board consider updating our libraries with culturally relevant material and that we ask Ms. Um, Stewart for a proposal. Um, I I don't know how we would motion without like a more specific proposal, but I would love to bring it back maybe the next board meeting, something like that. Would you be amenable to that, Ms. Hauser? I, I just want to ask for it. I'm not, we don't want to do anything, but just let's get one and see what it would take. And I guess there's two things. One is the cleanup. So I think we have to get stuff out of our libraries and then we've got to get stuff in, into our libraries. I just want to make sure that we're not, um, compromising the um doing this really carefully and thoughtfully for the urgency of doing it right away i'm totally I'm, with you I'm, we need to do this i'm not asking us to do anything i'm just asking miss stewart if she would give us a recommendation and we can consider that in a month from now or three months from now i don't care but i just want to move it I, you know i wanted to move to get it started. right and and thank you, Ms. Hazard, for that. I think our most important thing to start with is is educating our media specialists, so and and literacy coaches through that PD. So I think that's going to be the most important step to start with, so that they'll understand the books that are coming in and and be more um, you know be amenable to weeding out as per ALA white papers, ALSC, ALA white papers. So I think that's probably where we want to start um, so that they'll so that they'll have a more fuller understanding. You scared me. <laughs> Ms. Doyle. <laughs> Ms. Stewart, thank you so much for this presentation. And I just want to say again, um, for people who may be listening in that this is the third session of um, that that you've provided to our board and the other two are in community engagement and those um, recordings are archived and available for everyone to learn and each um talk you've given is so rich and detailed i mean we are so fortunate to have your expertise to share with us and so some of the notes um that i have um in preparation for tonight of things to pursue and i agree it's going to take um I want us to have full opportunity to pursue, but around community engagement, identifying families, speaking to the asterisk piece and um, establishing liaisons. Um, you've talked about the NCDPI um, 8048 module available for teachers, as well as us as board members and staff members. 
And um, that's free. It, okay, that's good. I was wondering about that actually. And then I know yeah. we need to come back to the Title VI designation um, mm -hmm. and um, gr formula grants that we can pursue with that versus other ways to um, achieve some of some of these goals. Um, and I really, you know, I have to say, I, as Ms. McKenzie was speaking about the impact like in an REI training, I'm still feeling the scales being removed from my own eyes listening to your talks. And um, some of the policy um, concepts didn't emerge in my into my head until um, hearing you speak tonight. And so it really just has does take time um, yeah. and commitment to to learning and and seeing how many stereotypes I've had myself. And so I'm just really grateful for your um, your generosity of spirit and your patience um, with us. Yeah. And we we have a wealth of resources that you've provided to us as a board, and I'm very thankful for that. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Anything else before we wrap this up? Oh, I unmuted. Ms. McKenzie. Bad sure. habits. I unmuted the presentation rather than turning on my microphone. I apologize, everyone. I was just asking um, the board if there were any additional thoughts. And okay. And now, Dr. Keeling, did you want to jump in? Yes, I did just want to say that we are already in the process of auditing our libraries. Our media specialists um, worked pre COVID putting together an entire rubric, a uh, culturally relevant rubric, and then COVID hit, but they were in the process of beginning to like train staff and we're working with CNI. New books that are coming in um, are being looked at going through um, both media centers as well as. Um, libraries within classrooms. All of that is already ball rolling in the process. That is great to hear. Thank you so much, Dr. Keeling. All right, well, um, thank you for this wonderful conversation. And I know that all of us are excited to dig deeper into those resources. And I am certain that we will be talking more about this at agendas coming soon. So. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Ms. Stewart, and we will hope to see you soon. Oh, yes, round of applause. All right, so the next item on our amended agenda would be the budget recommended updates. Um, Ms. Rath has said she feels like we could wait until the 22nd to do that. Is the board by consensus okay with that? Mr. Atherton? So just, just one comment on that. Um, I'm really concerned with what I'm seeing that's going to be presented given we've heard early discussions about the EOGs, EOCs, and what might need to change to get more help in the schools. So I, I just wanna say out loud that I'm concerned with the current way this is being presented and what we need to do once we review those scores and what we will need in the classroom. So I just wanted to say it here. I don't have anything specific, but I just wanted to say it. So if there's thoughts around that, as we get those scores, how would we change? So thank you for that, Mr. Atherton, Ms. Hauser, and then Ms. Smiley. Yeah, I, I just want to jump right on that and say, given where we are, um, with our end of grades, we know we've seen some preliminary data and that, um, and we're going to start the new, and we're working on summer school, but learning recovery for next year is a big deal. And we haven't seen the budget, any kind of planning or budgeting for that. And I, school starts in two months. And so bringing resources in is going to be a big effort if I'm hearing this correctly. And so when we see the budget, uh, you know, that seeing a uh, operating budget separate from the ESSER budget is very difficult for me because it seems to me that when school starts, we're going to need a vision of a classroom that are designed for learning recovery and it's going to be using all of that. So how do we see that? And that means the specialists and the, or the MTSS specialists and the SEL resources and all those kinds of things. So I'd like to see kind of a more holistic budget that really says we're going, we're, we know what we need to get ready for the new year. And I'd also like to ask if that would include 
do uh, planning. So we have a question about who is planning the um, recovery, the learning recovery, and do we have to take people who are on 10 month contracts and put them on additional contracts to do learning recovery? So those are the questions I have. So when we hear about the budget, I'd like to hear about all of that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Hauser. Ms. Smiley? Yes, just my two second um, uh, addition because we did discuss this topic during the budget committee. And just to clarify what the general um, purpose of this was, it was given the county commissioners do not seem to be um, headed in a direction of giving us, us an increase, but we have all those things we know we need. Um, what are some ways we might still adjust? How might we deal with that? That's sort of the purpose of this. I do absolutely agree that then we need to take that as a whole and understand then with the additional ESSER funding, how, how does it all add up? So thank you, Ms. Smiley, that's helpful. Anyone else? Okay, then we are um, gonna move right along into facility use fees. Good evening, Board Chair McKenzie, Vice Chair Stevens, Board Member Superintendent Dr. Felder, and community members. I have with me tonight Mr. Jarwin Hester, Director of Environmental Health and Safety. The purpose of this agenda item is to provide the Board of Education the proposed facility use fees for the 2021-2022 school year to comply with Board Policy 5030. This policy states that the superintendent shall present a facility use fee schedule to the school board by July 1 of each year. The proposed facility fees for the 2021-2022 school year are attached to this abstract. The date on the fee chart that you have in the abstract has a date of 2020-2021 school year, and it will be changed to reflect the 2021-2022 school year. The fees that are represented in the abstract are the same fees that were charged before the district discontinued facility usage Due to COVID, due to the COVID pandemic, and again, with tonight, we're going to recommend that we continue with those fees. Also, Orange County Schools Administration is recommending that beginning on June 14th, that we open our facilities for community use. It is expected all groups using Orange County Schools facilities will follow all safety protocols set forth by Orange County Schools. With that said, we also believe that it's important to once again to engage our community partners that use our facilities. Before I turn it over to Mr. Hester to briefly discuss the safety protocols that will be in place, I would like to mention that once Mr. Abilly, our new deputy superintendent on, is on board, he will review the fees and policies around facility use. At this time, Mr. Hester. Uh, it's great to be with everyone. And thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Jason, Superintendent Felder, uh, school board members, guests, and family. And moving forward, uh, we want to suggest some best management practices for for this this move. And I'll be brief, and I'll go through some of the safety protocols that we're looking at. These are just ways to kind of help improve uh, in going through this pandemic as well. First, we're going to look at all guests asked to proactively uh, follow the personal protective measures. And real quickly, that's social distancing, these hand washing. It well in buildings and also those capacities, just like in the building that you're in tonight. In addition, the masks will be worn indoors. In addition to that, sanitation, disinfections, and cleaning practices will remain in place. And as a result, we're asking guests to follow those guidelines and recommendations that are set forth in CDC, state, and the local Orange County Health Department. So these measures are just for the safety of staff and guests, and it's one of our top priorities at OCS. So any of these updates and changes, and you know, as this moves forward, and as we see the dimming of COVID, we'll definitely bring those requirements up and we'll present them accordingly. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Hester. Um, Ms. Smiley? Um, the only question I have is whether um, the contracts we do with organizations who rent space, whether they would not hold us liable if there were like COVID spread in the, as a result of the group gathering there. Do we know that? When you comply with your facility use um, procedures, state law declares that you're not going to be liable for um, things that result 
from non-school-based facility use. So the most important thing is adopting a fee schedule, enforcing a fee schedule, administration following the policies that you've set for facility use. Sorry. Great. Um, Mr. Atherton? So, so the question I have is, you know, seeing the significant difference between uh, for-profit and non-profit, you know, serving children, not serving children. And I did pull the application form 100, the uh, agreement checklist. And then I looked in policy and I don't see anything in our policy that actually requires us to actually verify that somebody's writing down a, a number or checking the nonprofit is actually a nonprofit. Um, I, I think we need to do that because this just begs for people to check that versus us having some procedure and policy, preferably in policy that says we will verify prior to rental. Other board members? Okay, well, um, with that, yes. Madam Chair, I move that we approve the Second. I have a motion from Ms. Stevens and a second from Mr. Atherton. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, everyone. Um, and then our last agenda item tonight is the first reading of new policies. I mean, I just can't even. Good evening. Good evening, um, Vice Chair McKenzie, Vice Chair Stevens, Board Members, Superintendent Felder, and the community. I'd like to present to you on first reading three policies for um, your consideration. The following policies will be 2610 Board Attorney, 4400 Attendance, Policy 1010, Board Authority and Duties, Policy 4316, Student Dress Code, and a dual policy 4040 and 7310 regarding staff-student relations. The first policy that I'd like to share with you is regarding policy 2610, and this policy has two required changes for, I'm sorry, I just lost my place. Just going to go out of order if you don't mind. I'd like to start with um, policy 4040 and 7310. Okay, this is student staff relations. This policy has two required changes. The first, it updates the reporting requirements in subsection C4, and it updates legal references. It also includes revisions. Um, and previous updates. And this is policy 4040-7310, student staff relations. I think we should vote on all of these at the end, but please feel free to jump in if you have questions about specific policies as we're going through. Okay, the next policy for your consideration this evening is policy 4400 attendance. This policy has a number of recommended changes and I'll go through each of them. It moves the role for attendance on remote instructional days to section A, mirroring the language recently added in the school attendance and student accounting manual 2020-21. The next recommendation, it adds a new section B to address student tardies and early departures. It updates the language in section C to reflect the language in the school attendance 
Student Accounting Manual 2020-2201. It updates the language in Section D to acknowledge the value of school-related activities. It moves the information about makeup work from Section C and D to a new Section E. It updates Section F to add information about disciplinary consequences for attendance and absences, unexcused absences, and it removes the reference to a two-day suspension. It removes information about academic consequences for excessive absences and replaces it with a new section G to address chronic absenteeism. Further, it creates a new section H that clarifies the language about students with chronic health problems and expands the statement about absences impacting extracurricular activities. It includes minor editorial changes, it updates legal references, and it updates cross references. Those are the changes for policy 4400. The next policy uh, that I'd like to share with you this evening is policy 1010, Board Authority and Duties. There are two changes that we'd like to uh, recommend for policy 1010 board authority and duties. The first change is in the board's duties. I wanna call your attention to duty two. We'd like the following um, to be considered for the by the board, um, providing leadership and direction through the formulation of goals and objectives, especially in defining and setting high academic standards for students and monitoring critical outcomes such as student growth and achievement. And that is the duty for duty two. The second um, recommendation that we bring forth to you tonight with regards to policy 1010 is in duty eight. We'd like to add um, a clarification to the statement um, to add in equitable, and it will read as follows. Considering the budget recommended by the superintendent, presenting the budget to the county commissioners and adopting a budget after evaluating whether the county commissioner's appropriation is sufficient to support a system of equitable and free public schools. Those are the recommendations for changes for policy 1010 board authority and duties. The next policy that I'd like to share with you this evening is policy 4316, dress, student dress code. In the first paragraph, we would add um, to the first sentence, Orange County Schools recognizes and supports the students have the desire and right to express themselves through clothing and appearance. So we would add in and appearance. The additional changes are as follows. We would add in the sentence, students should be able to dress and style their hair for school in a manner that expresses their individuality without fear of unnecessary discipline or body shaming. The next sentence that we would like to add to this particular policy reads as follows. The board prohibits the denial of educational opportunities based on hair texture or color, including but not limited to hair that is tightly coiled or tightly curled, afros and protective hairstyles, including braids, locks, twists, or bantu knots. These are hairstyles that have been traditionally worn primarily by people of African descent. In the last section, 
and this is right before the a section Ms. is right. Yes. Ms. Cunningham Brown, hold if you don't mind just one moment, we need to extend again for oh, just sorry. a few minutes. I'm sorry, give us just one second. Yeah. Motion to extend by 10 minutes. Second. I have a motion from Ms. Smiley and a second from Ms. Stevens. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. We have 10 more minutes, everyone. Thank you so much. Ms. Cunningham Brown, back to you. Okay. And um, the last change to this particular policy um, is in regards to the further guidelines around students should comply. It lists of uh, different things that students should comply with. If you look at the last provision that is bulleted that talks about head coverings are generally prohibited in the classroom, but allowed elsewhere in the school building. However, students may wear head coverings in the classroom as an expression of sincerely held religious beliefs, the jobs, the yarmulkes, or cultural expressions, galas, and we want to add these two um, additional um, descriptors for scarves and wraps or to reasonably accommodate medical or disability related issues. And those would be the changes that we recommend uh, for Par policy 4316. The last policy for review this evening is policy 2610. Again, um, this policy is identified as board attorney. Um, we'd like to uh, delete the following a sentence from the third paragraph. The sentence uh, was questions raised by members of the board and the attorney's reply will be reported to all board members. We are requesting that that sentence be um, removed from the policy. Um, if um, I want to call your attention to another sentence that we would like removed from the policy. If you look at the last paragraph, the sentence that reads, um, I'll read the sentence and then I'll let you know the sentence that we are requesting to be deleted. Uh, the chairperson of the board committee may consult with the board's attorney on issues that arise out of and in connection with the committee's work. We are requesting to delete the sentence that reads, the inquiry and response will be reported to all board members. We are instead asking for the following sentence to be included. The board attorney will share substantive answers to board members' legal questions with all board members unless the attorney determines and determines that confidentiality is required to protect the board members' legal interests. The, and those are the changes for policy 2610 with regards to board attorney. Um, these are our policies this evening for first reading um, that we are sharing with the board for your feedback and we will um, bring back on second reading. Thank you, Ms. Cunningham Brown. Mr. Atherton? Uh, just two, two comments on uh, policy 4316 for student dress code. I would really like us to consider adding in uh, a mask policy not, not because of pandemic, because if a student's sick, you know, it's common in other cultures to wear masks, to, to protect others against colds and things like that. And I think us being more prescriptive in there to add a mask policy that allows it for students that may have a cold or something like that. So I, we actually did talk about it and oh. decided that we needed to get past COVID and the like state mandate to wear masks. And right. then we would talk about it okay. because we all agree that we, folks should be allowed to wear masks if they want to, but we didn't want it to be confusing as it it's making it sound like it was optional right now because it isn't. It, <laughs> so that's, agree. That's completely. fair. Okay. I just want to make sure, I mean, it's good yes. time. I, I would not hold up the policy for this or anything like that. The, the second one is uh, policy uh, uh, 2616. The last sentence that's added, I'd like to get the attorney's perspective on what case would you do that? Because- Is that policy 2610, Mr. Ashton? Yes, 2610, I'm sorry, I wrote it, wrote it down wrong. 2610, um, where it's talking, where the attorney is talking to a board member and the board member is doing board business 
and that there would be a case where you, the attorney would believe that you wouldn't tell the rest of the board because it's in their best legal interest. That doesn't make sense to me. So I would love to hear an example of that. Yeah. So to, to just to be clear, um, when Ms. Cunningham Brown read the policy, she put she said the word board member's interest. What the change is is in the board's interest. So of course the board's lawyer has the ethical obligation is to the to the entity to the school district of the board of education. So to give you an example, and I. I believe from what Eva told me that this was something that she um, worked on with, with Jonathan. But as I think of examples that come to mind, I'll give you two. One would be a board member says, I had an unfavorable um, encounter with a staff member over my student. And so this staff member's contract is up for renewal. Um, should I recuse myself from the vote? So if I was going to train, if I was going to tell all board members that information, it would just be this board member has asked advice on whether they should recuse themselves from the vote and not any of the details behind it, because that would sort of That's obviate fair. the whole purpose of okay. the thing. So another, and I, if given more time, I could probably think of a better example. But so another example would be um, you have a number of policies, I believe, since you're and I know you're going to the school board association standard base model that require the board attorney to investigate claims against board members of uh, discrimination or harassment against people within the school district. And I can imagine many circumstances under in, in that kind of investigative process where you wouldn't share everything with everyone all at once. So those are the two best examples I can come up with off the top of my head. Okay, but it would still, this wouldn't prohibit if if somebody came to you meeting our ethics requirements for the board, meaning if, I don't know, some, some issue that came up and you advised them against doing something and we had a vote, for example, you would be obligated to tell us that result so the that you know we have a, a professor it used to be called ethical responsibility is now called professional responsibility yeah to provide our client with information that's germane that we that we think is germane so yeah. it doesn't matter what that policy says we would have to provide that information as as a lawyer i i would similarly have argued toward there needs to be some escape hatch because it's hard to imagine every eventuality and there are just yeah. some things that everybody shouldn't know all at once. I, I agree but I in agree. terms of anything that's germane to what the board needs to know your lawyer has that obligation to provide that information okay. another fair. thing eva um gave me an example of it's like if a board member comes to her and says do i have a conflict of interest because of a b and c and the answer is no then we don't need she to doesn't need to inform the entire board that that's fair i just wanted to confirm the scenario because it wasn't immediate obvious and so Thank just you. to get your the, for that part of that issue was on the when when the language said substantive my guess is that eva was thinking yes. so if it's again something that, something that would affect the right. outcome of votes or something like that. Any other questions before we motion to approve these policies, Ms. Hauser? Yeah, I have a couple. It's on. 10, we 10. have one minute before we have to adjourn. All right. Well, I have a couple. Well, we have to I, adjourn in a minute. So you want me to a five minute extension, or you want me to go? Just go. Okay. Um, Policy 1010, number two, I like that. Um, I think there should be something about financial outcomes as well. And on number eight, I think it's too process bound to the funding process of the county commissioners. I think it's the board's responsibility to approve the budget, um, consi you know, considering all funding sources and making sure that it supports the system of equitable and free, free public schools. But I don't think we should, tie ourselves only to the county commissioner budget. There's state funding. Hopefully there'll be grant funding in the future. So I just think we should not be so limited or process bound. Thank you, Ms. Hauser. Do I have a motion to approve these policies? So moved. Second. I have a motion from Ms. Stevens and a second from Ms. Smiley. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Well, I mean, we're already 
I mean, I've already called the vote. Doesn't that mean we have to finish the vote? No? Okay. Well, then. I mean, I think it was. It was well, well, my, well let me as, say my motion was to approve as presented by staff. And this is on first reading. Correct. First, first reading. reading. So you can revise. You, can, you got first a second, second reading, then you can talk about it and change. We. Okay. Motion passes. We will follow up, Ms. Hauser. We can talk about your we changes. Do it on the second, we do it on the second reading. And that we have more than a minute. So here's that. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? We're adjourned. Thank you, everyone.